Uh, good evening everyone and a uh, warm welcome to my panelists. Uh, so, I'll be moderating this panel on expense ratios and performance fees in the mutual fund industry. Uh, right, uh, so yeah, uh, just to set the context, uh, you know, SEBI came out with this consultation paper on performance fees and expense ratios and there is going to be another iteration of this. Uh, but there were a lot of interesting findings that SEBI made and a lot of interesting observations in this consultation panel, sorry, in this consultation paper. So, we'll get the things rolling and uh, Radhika, if I can start with you. Uh, SEBI found instances of, uh, you know, uh, brokerage and additional, other additional costs being on the, on very higher side in certain schemes. Uh, in your sense, you know, why there has been these cases of overcharging of brokerage costs and other additional costs, uh, if you can start with that. So, I, I fully expect it to be the <laughs> opening batsman on an extremely controversial last topic moderated by you. So I'm glad that you haven't disappointed. Um, and uh, after Deepak Khemani, who's my friend in the audience, started by asking Vetri if Bichara Active Fund Managers are dead, I fully knew what I was prepared for. So I'm prepared. Um, before I comment on this, uh, I should say, we are mutual fund CEOs, so we should start with a disclaimer, that the consultation process is mid-stage. There was a particular paper that came out that had a lot of the findings that we are, I think, going to be discussing today. Um, there was promised to be another consultation paper because we as Amphi represented a new set of data as industry. Uh, that paper is not out, uh, but we are told, at least from the last press conference, that it could be different. So this is work in progress. I, ju I just want to state that. Now, as far as brokerage and other expenses are concerned, what are other expenses? They are brokerage, GST, and STT. Two out of these three expenses are statutory expenses, let me say that. I do not think there has been overcharging of fees. Uh, in the paper, it was pointed out that in some categories, and you said that these other expenses combined exceeded the total expense ratio of the scheme. I would venture to think that's true in only one or two categories of funds like arbitrage funds. In an arbitrage fund, and we run one of the larger ARB funds in the country, when you do any churn, you pay brokerage, and because you have cash and futures position, you do churn every month. But when you do every churn, it is for the investor to make money. Finally, what a consumer gets is the NAV return. And all this shows up in the NAV return. So if a consumer is getting an NAV return that is meaningful, then you're okay. I always think a little bit of extra hullabaloo is made about expenses. Because if you look at liquid funds, the industry and regulatory cap is 1%. I don't think any of us runs our liquid fund at 1% because the TER of the liquid fund and the competitiveness of the industry doesn't justify it. So I don't think overcharging can happen, you know. Someone in the, I was hearing, someone in the uh, previous panel was making a comment about new players and pricing disruption. Uh, we happen to run the cheapest debt mutual fund slash ETF in the world already. So I don't think our industry sometimes gets enough credit for low cost pricing. But coming back to your question, I think this issue is largely the domain of select funds, including arbitrage funds, which the regulator has promised to look at, as per the statements in the press conference. In a normal equity fund, let me tell you what these expenses would be. If the fund manager is doing 40 to 50 percent churn, and the average brokerage rate is 8 to 10 basis points, they would be probably 5, 6 pesa of brokerage, 10 pesa of STT, and a little bit more of GST on top of that. This number, I don't think, it, unless you're running a very high churn strategy, exceeds 20 to 30 basis points. Uh, Avi, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I think at the, I mean, quite honestly, at the end of the day, what you're looking at are charges that you want to get a complete understanding of what your expenses are. Um, I mean, to Radhika's point, two of the three that were mentioned are already set, and they're not within control. Brokerage is one thing that is driven by essentially your investment style. So if you have a high turnover strategy, your brokerage costs are going to be higher. 
Now, I think any investor going into a fund is going to know or understand that or should understand that, right? That a high turnover fund is going to result in a higher level of brokerage fee. So I think having that included in there, while it may, I mean, in my mind, it would then have to make an adjustment to your investment style and approach. So that is something to be just, that we have to keep in mind when we think about those expenses. Suresh, would you like to add anything? Sure. So, I don't think any of the funds have exceeded the regulatory ceilings per se, because that's something that no auditor or no regulator will uh, accept. There are a couple of expense ratios which are allowed over and above the TR prescribed for the funds. One of them tends to be the GST on investment management fees. And that is outside the TR limit. Another expense ratio that is allowed outside the TR limit is B30 incentive. So a part of that extra, which Sebi has pointed out in the discussion paper, which is about 40 basis point difference, a part of that would be accounted for by these two items, which are statutorily allowed over and above the prescribed expense ratio. So just to kind of complete the picture, it's not that industry has gone and at random would have charged different expense ratio under the garb of the fund, but there are, apart from the TR limit, there are clear allowances that are made for these two items, one is one of which is GST on the investment management fee, and second is B30 incentive. Bo for both, the regulations are prescribed, and that's kind of determined there. Sandeep, would you like to add anything to I would definitely like to say a few things. So I think it's a, let's, I'll answer that this point later on. Let me just give you perspective. Let's understand SEBI intent first. The intent is very good to bring down the cost structure. And obviously certain provision which was showcased in that proposed uh, TR circular, obviously a lot of people have misused. So SEBI is trying to address through some regulations. So that's the background which we have to understand. Now let's come to the expense part, okay? Now if, if as a house, as a, if as a mutual fund we have to absorb the brokerage as well as TT, then I tell you it will lead to a massive arbitrage opportunity. Mutual fund balance sheet will be wiped out, AMC balance sheet will be wiped out. I'll give you a small example, okay? Because we have done this arbitrage business for donkey's years, we understand that space quite well. Let's say example, if any investor, whatever reason, expect the market should rally 5% from today onwards because we are in bull run, and he invests 100 crore rupees on any of, let's say, put in our scheme, okay? And there's no exit load in our schemes, okay? So 100 crore rupees come, and let's say in two, in five days time, he gets 2% returns, okay? So as a mutual fund, he has to just pay small STT, so he will take away 1.98% return from us in five days. Now, if he has to go directly to the market, he has to pay brokerage, he has to pay STT on that. In this case, he is not going to play. So all the HNI and family office will come to us and look at our cost. In this process, in that entire process, we will incur at least we have done a mass on this 100 crores, we will incur a loss of 43 lakh rupees. Okay? So if we understand this math, this is not viable. We have to shut down our shop if this comes into picture. Arbitrage will kill you. Okay? So it's not practically possible that if you come to mutual fund, mutual fund will absorb everything. If you go directly in the market, you have to pay a price. I don't think a lot of people have understood this point when the things were getting drafted. As an arbitrator, we have done this business. We understand it's a serious flaw. I don't think it will ever get passed. And I think we have highlighted to the regulator. I'm sure regulator is very mature. They will understand. They will also not like to see a situation like this where arbitrator take advantage and mutual fund business will be wiped out. So it's a very important point. Uh, Sandeep, uh, you know, as a follow-up, what do you think, you know, uh, another point that uh, Sebi had made in the consultation paper was including the tax-related costs, uh, STT, GST, is that a feasible thing within the T, including that, because they want TR to be an all-encompassing, uh, transparent ratio for the investors. See, again, this point is important because, see, really any services you rendered, taxes are over and above, okay? To say that taxes are part of it is not fair for the industry also because tomorrow STT moves up, tomorrow GST moves up, or it can come down also, okay? So that, that does not make any business sense. And I'm sure 
representation has gone to the regulatory bodies, I am sure they will look into it. As I said, our regulator is quite mature and we have in dialogues, MP is in talking terms with them. So it's, I think, should be sorted out because it's not viable for us to, if this get implemented, it's very difficult for us to manage. Right. Uh, anybody would like to add or I can move on to the next? So just one point I would make, uh, make on the total expense ratio for the industry. See, at the outset, we should understand this, that uh, right now when you look at bank deposits, bank deposits are about 7%. Do you know what is the NIM that banks make on an average? 4%. We are an industry which produces about 14 to 16% return on our equity funds. What's the expense ratio average that the paper has put out? About 2%. So this is indeed one of the lowest cost intermediation products. The other part, if I really compare our expense ratios with what is prevalent internationally, and I just did a quick check on some of our uh, SICAO funds, USITS funds, and there the retail share class expense ratio I saw in one of about 300, 500 million dollar product was about 2.2 percent. So at the outset, the expense ratios are not wide off what the international markets are, and compared to other financial products available, they are quite competitive. I just want to add a few points. See, the intent part when you talk about how to bring down the cost structure, okay? So if you look at the current circular, it does not address the operating cost issues, okay? There are vendors whom we pay on our AUM link services. Ideally, it should be transaction-based services, okay? Because they are offering a platform for transaction. But it is unfortunate there has been a practice that they take away fees on AUM basis. If you we analyze, let's say, our thing, our operating cost is nearly 20 percent, okay? So it's not viable. So if ideally it should be a transaction base. So whole idea is that how to bring down the operating or the transaction cost down, not at the cost of innovation. Because if any brokerage guys is servicing us, he subscribe a lot of databases, he's adding value, he's adding and generating my alpha. So we cannot penalize brokers for adding value and we reward vendors who are just doing processing job and take away certain AUM from us. So I think that is the rationale we have to understand. I'm sure regulatory is looking into it because these unwarranted costs which is there. Let's take one more example. When regulator talks about that as size of the AMC grows, the TR keeps on coming down, which is a, a right uh, approach. Similarly, the transition cost of these vendor also should brought down, not as a one mutual fund, as an entire industry. If industry has crossed certain size, these costs should brought down significantly. Today, let's say I think one of the panel members talked about key with the advent of geo coming into picture. Okay, that is a very important thing for us. If 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 the costs remain like this and somebody offer that 10 bips or 8 bips, this is business is not viable. So we have to uh, bring down the operating cost significantly rather than saying I'm bringing down the innovation cost. Then we are affecting our returns. We may not be doing justice with the investor community. The return should not be compromised because somebody offers our product. We subscribe, like we are not in the position to subscribe so much databases which the global firms give. So if we are, if they're taking a pie out of it, we are happy should be there adding value. But if transaction guys takes our percentage AVM, which is not fair. I would just make a point which I have, I'm so glad Sandeep made this point. I've been harping on this for years. Is that if you look at some of the funds we run, especially passive funds and certain categories of funds, there's a component called management fee which comes to us and there's a component called OPEX. In some funds today, OPEX has not reduced and the total amount I pay to vendors is higher than I keep as management fee margin. To me, that seems a little bit problematic. So I think there is an equal need for economies of scale to come through in the costs that we pay to RTAs, exchanges, vendors, depositories, etc., etc. And remember, AMC is an industry where there are 45 players. So there is a natural sense of competition and pricing that happens. Liquid funds, passive funds are one example. These are industries without taking names with often many fewer players where the incentive to do that is less. So operating costs have to come down. I should also say, and I think I speak on all four of our behalves, uh, running and making an AMC profitable today is hard work. It is really hard work and as an investor, you want your asset management company to be profitable so that we can invest in future growth. Whether it's hiring databases, whether it's hiring people, this stuff is expensive. You want your asset management company to be profitable. You don't want 
custodian of money to happen with a company that is not financially viable anything you would like to add or no i think i mean i think a lot of been said the only the only one thing i was going to say is that from uh, a gst as a consumer you pay gst for a service that you receive right it is not the service provider that is paying the gst so in this case if we were to include it it is turning that on its head to a certain extent which to kind of sandeep's point is maybe that's not necessarily fair for the amcs sure uh, and also uh, you know sebi had proposed a complete kind of overhaul of the entire way tr is structured right now you know it is scheme based tr and sebi wants to make it amc level tr the way they want to do is you know they want to come up with a weighted average tr for an amc say if it is equity assets you know first 2500 crore will be a certain 2.55 is the new tr they are proposing next 2500 would be 2. Point, uh, yeah i think 2.45 then they go down and gradually you know above 50000 crore it's just 1.3% so any thoughts on this uh, you know maybe suresh i can start with you uh you know how this can benefit uh, smaller players can this really give them a competitive advantage so i think in terms of uh, intent to do asset level tr that's what you're referring to compared to scheme level tr i think the intent is essentially to discourage switching in order to earn higher commission so that seems to be the broader point and i think there are the in addition to what they have suggested there could also be other ways to check that so that could be that uh, when you switch from fund a to fund b the lower expense ratio or the lower brokerage will be paid and stuff so there are less intrusive method also to achieve the same objective so while one understands a little bit about the saying that there could be economies of scale at asset class level to a certain degree part of it is true part of it is also incrementally if you're doing a let's say thematic fund a sector specific thick fund or a different market cap you need to add into the resources so there is a certain part which is right there but there can be other ways to achieve the same objective of preventing churning in order to earn higher commission in any case over the years there have been a lot of steps that have been taken to prevent churning so earlier you used to have upfront incentive that's gone it's full trail model and within that the differentials are very marginal right. radhika would you like to add to this so here i am going to go out in sort of unequivocally say that i like this suggestion i really like this suggestion and to me the small amc big amc part of this comes later i think if the principle of fees is that uh, the benefits of operating leverage should be passed to the consumer the reality is as someone running the business my investments or costs are not at a scheme level if i have a team for instance at edelweiss mutual fund we have three teams we have an equity team we have a hybrid team and we have a fixed income team my costs are actually at an asset class level so if my fixed income aum or if my equity aum hits a certain size then yes i am getting economies of scale i don't have economies of scale in balanced advantage fund versus aggressive hybrid fund broadly the same team is running them of course there are exceptions you know thematic funds etc and etc but for the most part i think the principle is grounded in fairness um now will it lead to a slight competitive advantage for small amcs versus mid versus large people say that and it may lead to an advantage on the pricing front but i don't think that's a complete picture so i have seen us at 6000 crores and 1.1 lakh crores the reality is that when a consumer buys a fund or when a distributor goes to sell a fund it's not just because a smaller amc xyz is paying you a little more brokerage than a large amc it doesn't mean the small amc sells otherwise nobody would have been a small amc even today small schemes because there is a merit to brand that has been built over time there's all of that so there is for anyone who's small there is a real struggle to grow and many of us have been through this so does this create an unlevel playing field for large amcs versus small amcs i don't think so 
Also, you have to remember people who are when they, large and small is a function of when you started the business. It's young and old. If you're building today, you don't have the advantage of back book that a lot of people had in the early era. So, a little bit of advantage because you don't have that playing field of brand. I don't think is a big deal. So, I I am principally very uh, happy with this. Right, uh, Sandeep, and then we will come to Avi. So, I agree what Radhika has talked about. You know. This is a very good step because the operating costs link at the overall company level, the organization level rather than a scheme level. So it's very healthy and obviously it will also support the young AMC, the smaller AMC. They can innovate things better. So it's a good uh, support which we can offer to the emerging AMC. That's point number one. And the second thing which Suresh talked about, obviously if, if this can be implemented, then switching will be stopped. The people should for just for the commission's sake. We have seen this thing, this phenomena quite common in the industry, in the regular plan. When the NFO comes, people tend to switch. And I think this is one of the important observations Sebi has talked about. And I think it makes logical sense to implement this thing. We'll be very happy if it get implemented. So I think any regulation or any, um, I think at the core, there's typically three things that I think at least I'm looking at, right? One is, does this help us in terms of increasing financial inclusion and increasing the education of our investor base? Two, is it helping reduce churn in terms of either or basically encouraging longer term investing? And then lastly, is it helping us develop the overall size of our market? Now, when we look at this change, this is definitely a positive in the sense that it does pass on the economies of scale to the investors. Now, broadly speaking, do we, does that have to happen in a vacuum? It doesn't. Because to the advantage, I know we talked about the fact that the smaller AMCs will have a slight advantage. Now, an advantage of the smaller thing assumes that pricing is the predominant reason why an investor makes a decision. And that is not necessarily the case at all. Because if that were the case, then the large AMCs are at an inherent disadvantage always. So that is clearly not the case. So in my mind, while this is a very, I mean, it is a good development because it does to a certain extent give a level playing field and does allow the smaller uh, AMCs to create at least some interest around it by allowing them with one lever that works. But that is not sufficient. That is not going to be the only driver. So I think there are a number of factors that need to be looked in. This is one element of it. Now, when we look at economies of scale and the advantages being passed on to the investors, the drive, and that's where I think education becomes that much more important. Because unless an investor base is educated that they can make the right financial decisions, they are always going to need some level of guidance or should have some level of guidance. Because if they don't, then the result is going to be actually worse off for an investor that is making ill-informed decisions. So this, I think, is actually a good step in, at least it's a good step in the right direction. Right. Uh, Avi, as a follow-up, you know, Sandeep also mentioned that, you know, Sebi had observed that there have been a lot of churning of investor portfolios, right? Uh, so any thoughts on this, you know, can this alone be enough to, you know, stop mis-selling happening, uh, you know, or can there be more uh, best practices that can be evolved to, uh, you know, address this issue? So I think churning, see, not all churning is bad, right? And that doesn't necessarily mean that it will, this will necessarily curtail churning either. But it goes back to one of the elements that I talked about, which is educating the investor base. Educating and making sure that people understand the value of staying long term. I think one of the stats put out there was that uh, 70 odd percent hold their investments for less than two years. Right? Now that is a significantly short period. But to put that in perspective, globally, holding periods have been shrinking dramatically. So if I look back a few decades ago, even in the US, holding periods were measured in years. Today, they're measured in months. So if you've held something for six months, you might be considered a long-term investor, right? which is an unfortunate reality. Now, 
we all know sitting in the room that the only way to truly create wealth is to leverage the whole concept of compounding, which in two years is not going to happen. Right? So anything that drives down the churn or reduces or encourages longer term investing is, I mean, gets uh, absolute support across the board. Can I go to Suresh and then I'll come back to Radhika and Sandeep? Sure. So I think uh, reducing churn is a very noble objective. N none of us would disagree with it per se because if you are shifting too often then you just can't take the benefit of compounding. So that's pretty much standard thing that all of us would have. Uh, one of the driver and if uh, for distributors could be alleged that some part of it could be because of the earning higher commission. I think the incentive is marginal. One has seen churn even in passive funds, which was, you know, same study finds that passive funds also there has been a churn of about 15 odd percent. So there's some amount of natural churn which continues to happen because investors probably maybe sometimes want to switch to a new theme or whatever. But indeed this number is a little higher in case of active fund, which is about 27 percent. So I think at the margin it would help a bit, but may not eliminate it completely. Radhika. So I have a slightly different point here, which is that, you know, there are ch there's churn for all kind of reasons. Uh, there's churn from underperforming funds to well-performing funds. There's churn from fixed income to equity. These are all good forms of churn. And then there's some bad churn, you know, that happens. I don't think it is fair to attribute all churn to mis-selling and distribution. And let me give you data on this. So we published a report on intermediation for our own assets at the end of March. It's on our website. Anyone can see it. It's called the Cox. And to Avi's point on compounding, we looked at percentage of assets that have been with us for the long term, which is more than two years. Sorry, it was two years. If I had done five, for a problem or uh, But we looked at just two years. Now, in the regular plan, that number was in excess of 30%. In the direct plan, where there is no distribution, so there can't be any mis-selling, it was 14%. So some of all churn does not happen due to mis-selling. In fact, at least our data seems to suggest that distributed assets have done a better job in terms of longevity than direct assets. Perhaps the real need is a lot more investor education and less chasing of one-year returns. Sandeep, like to add? what Avinash talked about is about that education is very important and I also agree what Radhika said that churn is should not be just looked at as bad churn okay it's a need based thing you know switching from underperformance to outperformance switching from asset classes you know from a taxation perspective and it's a completely human driven approach you know and there's a human cycle there you know wherever somebody can make extra money people tend to make it okay and then also we have to understand that the uh, uh, our real distributors, they are not real wealth manager, but over a period of time, they are also building their experience, you know, in advising an asset allocation, which leads to a churn. So I think they're also learning and evolving. So I think churn or switching, I will not the word use churn because churn we use more from the portfolio perspective, but more from a switching point of view. Every switching is not bad. Okay, so we have to be very careful in just making a generalizing that the churns are bad, but maybe, yes, regular churn which happen for a very short term opportunity, I think is about depending on the management of AMC or the marketing team, how we groom the people and how well we convey. I think it's a over a period of time people will learn that. Right, and Sebi has also, uh, you know, proposed sort of, you know, uh, trying to experiment with performance fees in the mutual fund industry. One approach they have come up with is, you know, having a TER at maximum limit of passive schemes and that then there can be an indicative return and then even higher TERs, asset management fees can be charged by, uh, you know, mutual funds. It's, you know, more on an experimentation level. But, uh, you know, any thoughts on this, uh, Suresh, if we can start with you uh, and then we can go to others. I think the concept is good. Very clearly, if when you are linking the uh, fees to the outcome, I think it makes sense. So from a perspective of uh, idea, I think it's a very good idea. Just that at this point of time, there are number of operating challenges that you would see because the, in the manner of charging, essentially you either charge it at annual basis 
but at the same time you claw back when the investor actually exits. So you have to recompute the whole thing as to whether the investor in the end made money or not. And based on that you charge a performance fee, which is a fairly complicated accounting thing to do and track it at investor's level. Uh, I think it's a lot easier if it is done in a close-ended fund because there all the investors exit on a certain day and therefore you can determine what the performance of that fund has been from start to end where everybody comes on a uniform date and exits on a uniform date rather than having to track every investor by investor. So therefore I think it's a Concept is very good. We'll have to find a practical way of implementing it, but I like the idea. Uh, Avi, anything on this? Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think conceptually and in theory, it is a very good idea, right? I mean, the concept of having being paid for an outcome, right? Um, operational challenges aside, right? I think that fundamentally it does require a certain change in the way we structure even our uh, regular, I mean we, right now we've got two share classes effectively. Theoretically you could create another share class, right? that would be a performance fee based share class. Now the operating challenges are there, right? but it is something that can be worked on and which is why I think it is right now in the sandbox to do precisely that. So eventually I think there will be a good solution that comes out of it and I think there will be certain people but I, I kind of go back to the whole concept of the purpose of introducing something like this is not so that you can drive your fees down, right? I mean, if you approach your entire investment decision on only the fee structure, you are never going to actually create significant amount of wealth, right? Because not always the cheapest fund is the best performing fund, right? It never happens. Neither is the most expensive fund the best performing or the worst performing, right? There is you go through phases. So I think performance fee as a concept is very good. How we implement it is what's going to be the challenge because there is not an easy process to doing it, right? Radhika, would you like to add? Uh, so I come from uh, the alternatives world and prima facie I believe optionality is good. Uh, what I like is that this is an option for AMCs and I think the proposition to the investor that look, if I don't meet the benchmark, you're just paying passive costs. It is a very nice sales proposition. And perhaps as AMCs, we can take the call to experiment this in certain kinds of schemes. For instance, I run a recently listed high alpha IPO scheme, uh, which might just lend itself very nicely to this. I think there are two parts to this. Both, both the gentlemen talked about the operating challenges not just in executing but in also explaining performance fees to clients, you know. I mean our level of financial literacy is reasonably basic today and this is a retail vehicle. So explaining this to clients is complicated. The second thing is it should never be seen as a way to save money. In fact, I would think of it as the opposite, you know. If the contours are right and by performing the AMC is actually able to earn incentivize fund managers yet not incentivize them to take too much risk because performance fees have that. So that structure needs to be worked out well. Sandeep. Yeah. So currently what SEBI consultation people talk about through sandbox approach, okay, but we will be very happy if we get implemented in real life, okay. Yes, like look globally look at the T20 model, T220 model exists for hedge fund or PMS or AI, but I think SEBI can be, yes, there are operating challenges. When you talk about fees should be yearly, quarterly or the track record of fund manager or fund house or operating uh, or the processes you are talking about. My simple thing is that if you want to really implement, we can implement with a monthly basis. Monthly outperformance, next one month you get extra fees, you underperform, it comes down. Okay. So there is a clear incentive for the money manager and the fund house to ensure it's put a lot of pressure on money manager and I think it will be in a larger interest will be very good and it should be well disclosed in SID okay, what is the percentage if you're looking at 2% outperformance, 3% outperformance and say we should look into it. We will welcome that stand on monthly basis, easy to implement otherwise it will remain a theoretical exercise. Great, great. Uh, so Corn can take the lead in that. We'll be waiting we are, very, we are for it. Uh, and uh, yeah, before I conclude, uh, you know, one uh, data point that Sebi uh, pointed out in the consultation paper was that only 25% of the MF folios uh, belong to women investors. 
Uh, so, Radhika, can I start with you? Uh, what more can be done to, you know, get more women to invest in mutual funds? Uh, this is not an answer for 20 seconds. Uh, although I, I think Sebi has proposed a couple of things in the consultation paper, including additional incentives on women investors. Must tell you though that in the data that Amphi released a few months ago, one of the fastest growing categories of investors was women investors and young women investors, so 20 to 35. I think the ecosystem needs to do a lot more for the cause of women investors. You know, regardless of what you think of the companies, the listing of companies like Nika tells you that India's women are a serious and growing consumer base. And all of us would be silly not to take uh, advantage of it. But this is a long problem that needs a much longer debate. It includes role modeling, inclusion. I mean, there's so much stuff to talk about. But the, few, the fact that Sebi has at least talked about incentives for women investors, 20% women IAPs, at least we are recognizing the problem. Right, right, right. Avi, would you like to add? Yeah, I think this is, uh, I mean, just take a look at our room here, right? I mean, I can count the number of women in probably my Or our hands. stage. <laughs> or on stage. Um, so I think it's an, actually having more women investors is a very important thing for multiple levels. I think there's enough, I'm sure you've all seen enough microfinance studies that show having an educated, a financially literate woman has a community impact versus an individual or a family impact when a male is financially literate. So I think there are a lot of social benefits to it as well. So, I mean, one of the things we've found, at least when in our own research, is that there's no reason why it can't be done. It just hasn't, right? I mean, even when I look at our teams, um, and we just did a kind of an anecdotal study and asked, say, okay, you're all working in the mutual fund industry. How many of you are actually managing your own investments? And we got maybe one or two people that put their hands up. And this is in our business. They are all making substantial amount of money. But who does it? You take your pick. Father, uncle, brother, anybody but them. Right? So it goes back to the point I was talking about, which is literacy and education. And I'm not talking about just overall literacy. I mean, we, I think it's clear from our graduation stats that women have been increasing and there's more graduating class women than there are men, but financial education and then being able to take charge of that. That is a critical factor. So anything that supports that, I think in my mind is an absolute no-brainer, quite honestly. I'm just going to add one point of, actually two points of data. You know, we are a 30 percent women company uh, and we are actually, I think industry is about 30 percent women investors without doing any campaigns for women investors or anything special. Somehow we realize we're 37% women investors. And when we go out and do distribution meets, because I travel a lot, multiple girls tell me more women just show up, more women IFAs just show up. So having more women in the ecosystem, actually without us doing much more effort, draws more women to the ecosystem. I'm also going to share you a smart stat on how good women are this. So we looked at our product-wise contribution by women uh, thematic funds, Edelweiss, Greater China Fund, US Tech Fund, 15% women investors. Like good Dal Chawal funds, like balanced advantage funds, 40% women investors. Suresh? No, so I think uh, there's been enough data about it, so I completely agree with it. I think there are two challenges that we face as a nation, I think, apart from women's investment being low. We also have a much lower women participation in workforce. And that is something that holds us back as a nation. So not only the investment, which is absolutely important here, and I'm glad Sebi has identified this issue, but we have to actually solve as a country this at multiple level. The labor force participation being a big one, where we lack almost every other country. Sandeep? Yeah, I agree with that. Sebi at least is acknowledging that this something should be done. But I have a very different perspective because a very difficult task, okay, is talking is very easy and implementing is very difficult. The best option is to just create awareness, educate people, the, because I believe the next generation, the, 
gender biases are getting diluted. At least in my generation, I have seen still biases. My dad's generation, there were very clear biases. So when I look at my kids and next generation, the biases are not there, okay? So if you educate, so we go out and educate a lot of people and encourage young generation to come. And I think the biases are not there. And if we can do that, we are able to address in a different manner and we'll achieve our goal. Okay, uh, I, I don't think we have much time left, but we can maybe squeeze in just one question if anybody has. Okay, please. Uh, would you say innovation in asset allocation is lopsided as it aggregates existing sophistication uh, as uh, in contrast to uh, increasing literacy uh, as a whole among no. the base? Can you uh, base. can you repeat? I mean, I don't think they got it. Right. Uh, what I meant was, I mean, would you say innovation in asset allocation uh, is lopsided? as it aggregates existing sophistication when it comes to mutual funds and other asset classes uh, and not on increasing the literacy among the customer base or the base you are saying that through innovation have, is uh, do you think it is lopsided when it comes to asset allocation and it is only more towards uh, you know increasing the amount of sophistication that is there when it comes to you know ai and other things and not on increasing the uh, you know the base through which actually we have understood right. See, don't mix up innovation with asset allocation. Mm. Right. Asset allocation is very individualistic need based on your risk profiling, your age, right. your perspective. But, but AI is taking it over. That's I mean, I mean it's no. Going, see, uh, very very clear. You know, yes. don't mix up asset allocation is an individualistic right. approach. Don't bring AI and innovation. You right. can't right. do any innovation. Right. It's right. my need. I will based on my need. I will decide. Yes, innovation can be done on all the product. I think I think we have series of panel discussion on that. So don't get confused with that. That's only my suggestion. Can I just make a point on AI? Because every single location I've been traveling, everyone's been telling that me that all of us are not going to have jobs in a few years because of AI. So I'm going to ask you guys a question. AI is innovative, right? Was this innovative? Was this disruptive? Was this disruptive? Was the cell phone disruptive? Okay. Did we all disappear after a cell phone? No. Uh, was the internet disruptive? Did we all disappear after the internet was founded? No. However, if you were an asset management company, or if you were a financial advisor who said, I phone not use karunga, I internet not use karunga, would you have been around? Chances are no. So I believe AI is real. It is coming. But it is a co-pilot, not a pilot. I think all of us will have jobs to do. Uh, but if we don't know how to use this, then we have a challenge. So I sometimes question, you know, the extreme thesis around AI. There was someone who told me when I was in Badoda that Infosys, uh, their hiring has changed because of AI patterns. Six months before AI came, Infosys' ke result abhi wo ho gaya. Come on. So let us be aware of the new technology that is coming out, but beware also of falling to false narrative. Yeah, so I mean, you're, I think linking innovation and asset allocation is a bit of a stretch, quite honestly, because asset allocation is driven by a whole host of different factors. What you're talking about is that the ease with which somebody can get an optimal asset allocation now, can that become simpler and does that mean that Radhika and I will be out of jobs, right, and the rest of us. I, I mean, I've been, I mean, I've been a fund manager for a good part of my career and this is not the first time technology, so to speak, is supposedly going to wipe us off the planet, right. Initially, it was algorithm-driven models that were going to take away all our jobs. Uh, then it was obviously taking predictive analytics, adding that onto it, and therefore you are all going to lose your jobs. Now, there is always a doomsday scenario that is painted for every innovation that occurs. But I find that most, what ends up happening is our ability 
to utilize that technology. So, I mean, I'll use our example, right? I mean, machine learning is something we have been utilizing in our investment process globally for years, right? In certain strategies, it lends itself, and that's what we found. Certain strategies, it lends itself towards that. It helps. And certain strategies are not as effective. I mean, if you think about it, if AI-driven or, I guess, algorithmic-driven models were the answer to all our cures, GFC should not have happened, right? Because there would have been a competing bid for every seller. Well, what happened was every algorithm is driven by correlations, right? You're effectively trying to reduce the correlation of the asset mix in your portfolio. That is what you are trying to do. In a crisis, correlations all go to one. So it's immaterial because then when that happens, all the model spits out is the same. So it doesn't matter which fund house had it, all of them were saying you have to sell it now. So I don't necessarily think that it is one size fits all and it's going to be either feast or famine. Right? It is how do you utilize it? Right? And that I think even as advisors, it is going to be critical to be able to utilize this technology, understand it. And just because AI spits out an asset allocation does not make it kind of the truth, right? You have to apply some level of, and that's where I think one of the earlier panelists in that talked about that, human intelligence is still far superior to anything a machine can do, right? So I just feel that it's not a, I mean, I think there is no real kind of panacea, so to speak, that, you know what, if I run it through chat GPT, give me the best asset allocation, then I'm going to go to sleep at night. It is not going to work. And some folks that do do that are going to find out the hard way. Yeah, Suresh, should you like to add anything? No, I, I think we have discussed enough. I'll just say that, you know, a few years back, the same thing sa was said in case of wealth management, that robo-advisory will come and the advisor will have no space. But the reality is advisors have stayed, they've grown. Essentially because what happens is, in a bad market situation, your robot does not give you comfort. If the market were to fall tomorrow 10%, you want to go back to your advisor and want to understand as to what to do now. The screen does not tell you what to do. The screen just shows you red, red, red. And therefore, I think somewhere or the other, having that human connect would remain important irrespective of how much technology advances. And I do think investment and advisory are a little high touch business, particularly from a distribution or let's say wealth management standpoint. Right. Uh so sorry if anybody else had any question, but uh, I think on that note, we can conclude the panel. Thanks a lot to my panelists for their insights, their thoughts, and thanks to the audience for their attention. Thank you so much.